Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I'm going to read the first eight verses. And our topic is education, Christian education in the state. And uh, we've been looking at it for a few weeks. And we're discussing things like who's responsible for the education of children and who's responsible to finance the education of children. And we're interacting with a couple of different views. There's two errors that we want to steer clear of. One, of it, one is, is that only homeschooling is allowed. Nobody can teach your children other than you. Uh, the other position that we want to steer clear of is what I've been calling Christian statism. And that's that the, in a Christian commonwealth, a Christian state, the civil officials have a right to tax the people that has take money by coercion and to use their money to educate children besides their own children. And so we're interacting with both those positions, and today we'll be primarily finished refuting the second one. But I'll begin reading at verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Okay, clearly the centrality of the parents in Christian education. Now we were looking at the role of the priesthood and the Levites last week, and we're continuing with the Levites, and we ask the question, were the Levites tax collectors for the state? Now, the reason we asked that question, we began this last week, the reason we asked this question is because that is the central, if you're going to have this argument from the specifics of Scripture, that is the central argument used by Christian statists to justify a Christian state collecting taxes by coercion for the use of public schools, which really are parochial schools or church-run schools. So we're continuing with that. After asserting that some of the Levites were civil officials, which we have proved to be erroneous, we've taken all their main arguments and shot each one of them down using scripture, those who favor state financing of public schools attempt to turn these civil or secular Levites that's an oxymoron. The Levites were not secular officials, they were religious officials. And to tax collectors for the state. This is done by the following argumentation. First, it is noted that Levites, excuse me, it is noted that the tithes are moral in nature and continue into the New Covenant era. And with that we agree. The tithe belongs to Christ and must be given to the church for its support. And one could cite a number of passages. 2 Chronicles 31, 4 to 6, 1 Corinthians 9, 4 to 11, 1 Timothy 5, 17 to 18. Paul made it crystal clear that those who preach the word should get paid. Teaching elders should receive double honor. Teaching elders should get paid. One doesn't plow and not eat of one's food. To refuse to tithe is a serious sin. For those who refused to tithe were accursed, uh, excuse me, were accused of robbing God. And that's Malachi 3, 8 to 12. And if you can read it later, God gets angry with the people because they weren't tithing. And God says, you're robbing me. You're robbing God. You're robbing money that is for the purposes of the kingdom of God. It is clear that tithing was used in the New Covenant era to support the work of the ministry, which included gospel preaching and teaching. 
1 Corinthians 9, 4 to 11, and then 1 Timothy 5, 17 to 18. Caring for the worthy Christian poor. Matthew 6, 3 to 4, Luke 12, 33, Acts 6, 1 to 6, 1 Timothy 5, 3 to 8 and 16, and James 2, 15 to 17. And helping other Christians and churches in emergencies or periods of calamity or crisis. Remember, Paul collected tithes. Bring your tithes into the church. That's 1 Corinthians 16 on the first day of the week. Set them aside. And when I go to Jerusalem, I'm going to take them down there because they're having a drought and they're having a famine. <clears throat> and uh, we want to help them out. That's 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 4. And also see 2 Corinthians 9, 5 to 12. <coughs> Second, since tithing is required by law, that it is not voluntary, the Levites collected the tithes at the command of godly kings and governors. For example, Nehemiah 10, 37 to 39. <clears throat> and we, of course, noted the example of Joash going to Jehoiada, the high priest, and saying, look, I asked you guys to collect the tithes for the repair of the temple, the refurbishment of the temple. <clears throat> and this is a, a few years have gone by, and it's not it hasn't happened. Take care of it. So we see that in Scripture. There's no question. Now, we agree with everything so far. And here's where they start to go wrong. <clears throat> and some of the Levites were civil or secular officials. Their whole argument hinges on that being true, that they were civil governmental officials, not religious officials. Christian kings, prime ministers, or presidents can order civil officials to gather taxes to support the church, including Christian schools. Okay, I'm giving you their argument. In addition, it is argued that the Levites did not need any kind of civil enforcement of the tithe, that is the use of police officers or those who can use coercion, because they were civil officers. Once again, everything hinges on the fact, on the assumption that the Levites were civil officers. They had coercive authority from God and the civil magistrate to enforce the state's tax policy. The Levites, it is argued, had a command to take the tithes from the Israelites. And they like to cite Hebrews 7, 5. So this is the argument for state funding of Christian schools in a nutshell. Now, it may be convincing to those who are ignorant of Scripture or uh, who are attempting to justify human traditions. But it is easily refuted if we use biblical procedures for interpreting Scripture and basic logic. Okay, let's not go to Scripture with an assumption. Hey, if Scripture teaches that the state should collect taxes and pay for schools, fine. But it doesn't teach that. It suffers from many errors and illegitimate applications. First, it confuses a biblical requirement that the Levite must collect the tithe with a coercive, completely involuntary collection of taxes. Okay, those are two separate things. They're not the same thing. The Levite did have a command to receive the tithe, but they did not have a command to take it by force. And you can read the whole Bible very carefully. You will never see the Levites using the sword to collect the tithe. They used the word of God, and they told the people, if you don't give, God will curse you. But you don't see them using the sword. The word translated take, lekach, I can't pronounce the Hebrew very good. It's, it's got one of those funny endings. In Hebrew can mean receive, and is better translated receive in Numbers 1826. And by the way, the Jewish Publication Society renders the verb lekach, receive in this passage. The word take is fine, as long as there are no coercive overtones. That means take by force. 
go over to Mary's house and take the cookies to Martha's house. That means go get the cookies and give them to Martha. That doesn't mean go get the cookies and if she doesn't want to give you the cookies, beat her up and take the cookies. Okay, people want to use the word take in a coercive sense and that's not what it means in the Hebrew or in the context. This point is established when we look at the inspired historical examples of how the Levites raised money or collected tithes in special times of need. Uh, let's look at, for example, let's look at 2 Chronicles 24, 4-14. I'll read this carefully. Pay attention. And we're going to Joash and Jehoiada. And it came to pass after this that Joash was minded to repair the house of the Lord. Joash is the king. And he gathered together the priests and the Levites and said to them, and once again, we see the Levites coupled with the priests. If you, want, you can't turn the Levites into civil officials using coercion and not turn the priests, who everybody acknowledges are religious officials, uh, into the same thing. <clears throat> Gather together the priests and the Levites and said to them, Go out into the cities of Judah and gather of all Israel money to repair the house of your God from year to year and see that ye hasten the matter, albeit the Levites hastened it not. And the king called for Jehoiada the chief, that's the chief priest, the high priest, and said unto him, Why is thou not required of the Levites to bring out of Judah and out of Jerusalem the collection, according to the commandment of Moses, the servant of the Lord, and of the congregation of Israel for the tabernacle of witness? For the sons of Adaliah, that wicked woman, had broken into the house of God, and also had dedicated the things of the house of the Lord, uh, they did bestow upon Baalim, Baalim, Okay, it was not only a, a matter of the, the temple falling into disrepair, but they were messing things up, the Baal worshippers. And at the king's commandment, they made a chest. And you read about that same chest in the days of Jesus uh, when they put the money into it. Or it could have been a different chest, but the same principle. At the king's commandment, they made a chest and set it without the gate of the house of the Lord. And they made a proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem to bring into the Lord the collection now listen carefully, that Moses, the servant of God, laid upon Israel in the wilderness. So what is the king doing? He's telling them to obey the word of God. And all the princes and all the people rejoiced and brought in and cast into the chest until they made an end. Now it came to pass that at what time the chest was brought into the king's office by the hand of the Levites, and when they saw there was much money, the king's scribe and the high priest's officer came in and emptied the chest and took it and carried it to his place again. Thus they did day by day and gathered money in abundance. And the king of Jehoiada gave it to such as did the work of the service of the house of the Lord and hired masons and carpenters to repair the house of the Lord. And also as such wrought iron and brass to mend the house of the Lord. So the workmen wrought and the work was perfected by them and they set the house of God in his state and strengthened it. And when they had finished it, they brought the rest of the money before the king of Jehoiada, whereof they made vessels for the house of the Lord, even vessels to minister and to offer withal, and spoons and vessels of gold and silver, and they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord continually all the days of Jehoiada. Okay, all the vessels had been destroyed or confiscated by the worshippers of Baal. So they not only refurbished the temple, but they collected enough money, gold and silver, to replace all of the various holy spoons and utensils and so forth. So this money is being used for sacred activities. Now this passage is very instructive on the function of the Levites and the tithe and the civil magistrate for a number of reasons. Number one, note that the king has the authority to tell the priests and the Levites to obey scripture and do their job when they fail to do what God requires. The king has the authority or we could say the civil magistrate has the authority to tell the church to do its job when it's not doing its job. And we'll look at that a little later in the Westminster Confession, where when there's unusual circumstances, they, the king can call together the, a, a general assembly or a council and tell them, get your act together and fix this. It is important that we recognize that the king does not appeal to his own authority he doesn't argue on the basis of the so-called divine right of kings. I'm the king, I tell you what to do. But, bases his argument directly on the law of Moses, verse 6. You need to do what the word of God tells you to do, and you haven't been doing it.
Number two. When Joash wanted to raise money for the repairs and refurbishment of the temple complex in Jerusalem, he did not go to a special class of civil servant Levites and tell them to go out and collect taxes by force. Okay, if, 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 if there was this special civil class of Levites who were the tax collectors of the state, that's what we would expect. That doesn't happen at all, does it? Instead, he met with the priests and the Levites and told both groups to go. Verse 5. They were summoned to go among the people and collect tithes and offerings for the temple. And the account in 2 Kings 12.4 focuses on the priesthood. Listen to what it says. And Joash, King says another spelling of his name, Jehoash, said to the priests, all of the money of the dedicated gifts that are brought into the house of the Lord, each man's census money, each man's assessment money, and all the money that a man purposes in his heart to bring into the house of the Lord, let the priests take it themselves, each from his constituency, and let them repair the damages, or literally in Hebrew breaches, in, of the temple, wherever any dilapidation is found. So the fact that the collection of the tithes was overseen by both the priests and the Levites refutes all attempts to turn only some Levites who are supposedly civil officials into tax collectors for the civil government. Okay, I hope you see that. You say, well, that's, you're getting pretty picky there. Well, we don't want the state writing checks to the church in, or, or, or to Christian schools. And if you think that's a good thing, then you're naive because the state will have strings attached. Even a Christian state will have strings attached. The Old Testament system of tithing together with special gifts above and beyond the required religious tithe carries over, by the way, into the New Covenant era with the diaconate and the Pauline admonitions regarding the church's responsibility to pay for ministers of the word or teaching elders. 1 Corinthians 9, 4 to 14, 1 Timothy 5, 17 to 18, and to care for needy Christians, Acts 6, 1 to 6, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 3, 1 Timothy 5, 3 to 4, and 16, etc. So the Levitical responsibility to collect the tithes carries over into the New Testament, not with governmental officials, not with civil officials, not with secular officials. But the diaconate collects the money. And by the way, in the ancient church, I forgot to look it up. In my book on women deacons, I discussed this. The ancient church, the post-apostolic church, referred to deacons very frequently as Levites. They actually called them Levites. They collected the money, and then the money was distributed to pay for the poor and to pay for the pastors. There is no indication at all that the tithe for the temple was shared with the state or placed under the civil government's control at any point. The regular assessments and free will offerings came into the temple treasury, the house of the Lord, 2 Kings 12.4. Now the chest of money, of tithe money, was brought before the king, however, for the inspection of the king. The money was inspected to make sure everything was above board. It was not taken or shared by any civil magistrate, by any civil officials at all. We'll see in a little bit. The scribe helped count it with a, an official of the high priest. What's going on there is the state's not taking control of the money. The, state, the state's making sure there's no fraud. And by the way, you can see that in 2 Chronicles 24.11. In addition, when the priests and Levites did not do their job effectively or faithfully, but rather were complacent regarding this matter, the king did not personally threaten the priests and Levites, but went to their religious leader, the high priest Jehoiada, and asked him, verse 6, why have you not required of the Levites to collect the tithes? Verse 
If there was a civil class of Levites who functioned directly under the civil magistrate, who collected taxes for the state, there would have been absolutely no reason for the king to go to the high priest, which was a recognition of the priesthood as Levites as a separate covenantal sphere, a separate religious class. He could have just simply ordered the civil officials to go out and collect the money. He doesn't do that. He goes to the high priest because the high priest was over the Levites, all the Levites, even the police officers. Remember, the Levites had military personnel or police officers, not because they were going about the land engaging in civil affairs, but because when they had festivals at the temple, there were these huge crowds, and you needed somebody to control those crowds. Somebody who was as part of a special religious class who could be in places near the temple that ordinary policemen shouldn't go. We see that all the Levites, even the temple guards, judges, and officers were part of a religious class under the authority of the high priest. The collection of the tithe was a sacred function, not a civil function. You got that? The collection of the tithe was a sacred function, not a civil function. Apparently, the original atonement tithe that was collected when all the men 20 years of age and older were numbered for war becomes an annual tithe at some point. Note verse 5, from year to year, and also see Nehemiah 10.32, which meant since year to year. So we, clear, we, we see clearly by the time of David and beyond uh, that the, we have an annual assessment. It's annual. Number three. I mean, obviously, if the, the Levites or the priests were committing some sort of a crime, like murder or theft or something, the state would get involved. But the state's not to get involved and interfere with the church unless there is a crime biblically defined. Well, number three. The collection of the tithe throughout Israel did not involve coercion, but persuasion through a proclamation. Then at the king's command, they made a chest and set it outside of the gate of the house of the Lord. And the account in 2 Kings we read, Then Jehoiada the priest took a chest, bored a hole in its lid, and set it beside the altar on the right side as one comes into the house of the Lord, and the priests who kept the door there put all the money brought into the house of the Lord into it. 12.9. Now, by boring a hole into it, what does that mean? It means nobody can sneak, <laughs> nobody can get any money out of it. Nobody can stick their hand in there and take money out for themselves. It's going to be counted in front of the representative of the high priest and a representative, the scribe uh, of the king, and they're going to make sure there's no fraud. They're going to make sure that that money goes to the point it was intended for, the temple. And they, that is the priests and Levites, made a proclamation throughout all Judah and Jerusalem to bring to the Lord the collection that Moses, the servant of God, had imposed on Israel in the wilderness. Then all the leaders and all the people rejoiced and brought their contributions and put them into the chest until all had given. 2 Chronicles 24, 8 to 10. Those men who were in charge of ecclesiastical affairs who ministered at the sanctuary were responsible to raise the funds necessary to maintain the temple complex. The people were never threatened with the use of force by the state. They were simply told to do their duty according to the law of Moses. They were told Obey the word of God. This is clearly the function of a teaching elder in the New Covenant era, not a civil official. Now, once again, the magistrate can tell the church to do its job when it's neglecting its job. But there's no force here. There's no sword used here. Obey scripture. This example is little different than how churches raise money today. They ask for it, appealing to the word of God. You're required to tithe. If you don't tithe, God will 
curse you. And if one wanted to, they could make a case that there could be church discipline involved if people refuse to tithe. But the state is not involved. And we noted, by the way, when we looked at uh, the intertestamental period and the period in the days of Christ, as described by Edersheim, we noted that by the time that Christ was alive, there was another box with a hole in it used for synagogue parochial schools. That if people wanted to give above and beyond their regular assessment, their regular required tithe, and they wanted to make sure that that extra money went to pay for the parochial school system in Israel, they could put money into that box. That's interesting. Number four. The point being, by the way, that the, the state's not involved and there's no coercion involved. Number four. The civil magistrate's role in making sure the temple was refurbished involved A, telling the officers to do their job as commanded in Scripture. These are church officers. B, making sure that the monies given were used for the reason given. And C, making sure that no fraud occurred in reckoning and distributing the funds. The king told the priests and Levites to make a chest so that the tithes and offerings given to refurbish the temple would not be misappropriated and used to give the priests and the Levites a large raise. Okay, if, you, if you study this passage in Chronicles, and it's got an accompanying passage in Kings, there's a lot of speculation on the part of commentators that what was going on was is that not only were the Levites and priests being kind of lax about raising the money, but what was happening is the money wasn't making it to the temple fund. They were spending it on themselves. Thus, let's have a box with a hole in it. You guys leave that money alone. We're going to use this for the temple. You're going to get paid, but we've got to take care of the temple. It indeed is very possible that one reason the Levites were slow in raising the funds is that only part of the gifts given for the temple went to the temple. In addition, if people have assurance that the money they are giving to the temple will actually in total go to the temple, they will more likely donate more funds to that project. Anybody who raises money knows that. If you tell people, look, we have a mission in Africa, and the school burned down at this mission in Africa, we need some help. And it's a really good mission. It's reformed. It's got solid teaching. They're doing a great work in Africa. By the way, 100% of your tithe money, your love gift to this work, will go to that work. None of it will be taken by the church. None of it will be used to pay bureaucrats. None of it's going to go to a bureaucracy or anything. Every penny is going to go to that school. Well, people are much more likely to give, aren't they? They are. The king, as part of the Covenant of Reformation, had taken a special interest in this positive work of restoring the true worship. Remember, when you have a Reformation, it has a negative side, removing idolatry, removing false religion, getting rid of the old pagan priests, getting rid of the old pagan priestesses and the idols and the false shrines and so forth, the high places. That's one aspect. The positive side is repairing the temple, making sure all their utensils are back, restoring the true worship of God as commanded in the law of Moses. And of course, there's further revelation in the period of David by David and Asaph and others for the temple. That's what Reformation is. It's both negative and positive. This is the positive part. They needed money to fix the temple. Therefore, he not only gave instructions designed to raise the needed funds, but sent his secretary recorder, or literally scribe, what do scribes do? Well, they record things. They're also scholars. To count the money together with the high priest and then hand it over to the superintendents of the building or those in charge of building the building or repairing the building. Telling the church to do its job, making recommendations for raising money, and helping prevent fraud is something far different than civil officials taking taxes by force and distributing them for parochial or public schools. Completely different. That money never touched the hand of a state bureaucrat. 
bureaucrats had, state bureaucrats had nothing to do with raising the money. They had nothing to do with using force to collect taxes. These were ties. They went directly to the temple. The tithes gathered by the priests and the Levites were not taken and distributed by the state. The king, together with the high priest, faithfully paid the money to the workmen, verses 12 and 13, not to teach us uh, to give our tithes to the state, but to show the cooperation of church and state in the work of reformation. Now, you hear about ministries like Jim Baker and, you know, the, in the old days, in the 80s, and some of these ministries, and what they're doing is they're, they're collecting uh, voluntary ties, and they're, they're telling people, and a number of ministries have been convicted of this, it's fraud. You go on television, you say, we have a mission in Haiti, and all your money's going to go to build them a school and to pay for food, because they're very poor and they're starving. And the, the civil magistrate has every right to look at what and see if the money was actually used for what it was supposed to be used for. Because some of these guys, these, these false prophets, they're usually charismatics and Armenians, they'll collect a million, they'll collect five million dollars and they'll give fifty thousand dollars to Haiti and the rest of it goes in their pocket and they're driving around in a Rolls Royce and they're buying giant mansions. The state has that right. Because that's fraud. That's a crime. But that's different than the state collecting taxes at the edge of a sword. Those who see state coercion in these kinds of passages must read it into the passages. For placing money in a box at the temple is far, far different than a property or a sales tax. Okay, what happens if you don't pay your property tax? What happens? They take your house away and they kick you out. That's an involuntary tax. And almost all of our property taxes go in America, in the United States, they go to state schools, which are secular, humanistic, satanic schools run by a bunch of Democrat unions, sodomites, feminists, and atheists. The, ta the tithe system was based on trust and hearts that obeyed God, not the sword. They used the preaching of the word to convict and get money, not the sword. And the people, God changed their hearts and they gave willingly and they gave a lot. There was plenty of money. This point is evident given in the fact that the money was counted and collected after the box was filled and not before the money was individually placed in the box. So that money did not touch any state officials at all, ever. It was only a state official was there to make sure that the money went to be used for what it was supposed to be used for, that's it. Second, the idea that civil officials can use coercion and, uh, uh, to collect ta ta taxes or tithes and then distribute that money as it sees fit to the church for education and other projects, gives the state financial authority over the church. Don't you realize that? You're giving the state financial authority over the church and places a state bureaucracy between a Christian's tithe and the church officers who have been set apart and ordained for the purpose of distributing the tithes. Do you see that? How dangerous that can be? Instead of the state being a nursing father who protects the church and gives the church gifts from its own resources, the state becomes a controlling father who milks the church and gives the church back some of its own money. You see the difference? If I, if I take a gun... And I come to your house and I take some, I take a thousand dollars of your money, and then I come back a week later and say, "Here's two hundred bucks. Go get some groceries." Isn't that nice? Isn't that a nice gift? Am I not a wonderful charitable person? <laughs> That's not charity. 
That's not charity at all. The state is to be a nursing father, not a controlling father. The state is not to collect payments owed to the church for its educational purposes. They're owed to the church, not the state. Remember, the tithes went directly to the temple and in the New Covenant era are dropped off at the public worship of the church on the Lord's Day, 1 Corinthians 16, 1-2. This is how things work. Okay? Today, many churches pass a, ba uh, they pass a basket around or a, or, a, or a little plate and they collect money. That's not right. The synagogues had a box in the back of the synagogue where you dropped your tithe in it for the synagogue. And then you read 1 Corinthians 16, what do they do? Whatever, you know, if, it, if they brought gold or silver or if they had extra chickens or extra eggs or some wheat or some barley, they brought it and they placed it at the church. The deacons took it and they put it in storage and they used it to pay the pastor and the expenses of the church. That's what happened. The tithes are distributed by the deacons, Acts 6, 1 to 6, under the supervision of the elders, obviously. Those who claim that some of the Levites were civil officials who collected taxes for the state need to explain how their concept would work in the New Covenant era. Would some of the deacons or ruling elders collect money for the state and then go back to the state and ask for some of that money back for education? Okay, if they're going to be consistent, remember the Levites become the deacons and to an extent ruling elders. To be consistent, how would this apply in the New Covenant era? It wouldn't just simply be civil officials doing this. It would be church officials who had a dual role as, as state collectors and church collectors. Would some of the elders and deacons serve as government officials and hang on to the church's money? Both options make no sense whatsoever. To allow a civil official to collect a tithe owed to the church is an unscriptural mixing of the covenantal spheres of the church and the state at the church's expense, not the state's expense, at the church's expense. The money belongs to God. The money doesn't belong to the state. The money should go right to the church. It shouldn't go to the state so the state can decide what to do with it. The tithe does not belong to the state but to God and is to be used for spiritual kingdom work. The elders or deacons are competent to use the money for educational and charitable purposes and do not need a government bureaucrat to handle the church's money or to tell the church how to spend their money. Because of the pollution of sin inherited from Adam, God has ordained different covenantal spheres so that power or authority would be decentralized and men could have liberty under God's will law. Yeah, now, when you hear people talk about the U.S. Constitution and the wisdom of having different branches of government that are che checks and balances, checks and balances. And then people will often talk about how, well, the, this was based on the Bible. And this is based on the idea that man is depraved and man needs checks and balances. Well, we find checks and balances in the word of God. There are different covenantal spheres so that the state won't become too powerful and intrude upon the rights of the church. The church is not to intrude upon the rights of the state. Caesarea papalism, you see. And the state is not to intrude upon the rights of the family, and the church is not to intrude upon certain rights of the family, unless, obviously, that's required for discipline. In the Middle Ages, power was concentrated way too much under the papal church. With the Renaissance and the so-called Enlightenment, we should call it the Endarkenment, Political power has increasingly been viewed as bringing utopia or salvation to society. The state is viewed as the great agency of social change and societal reformation. That's just the modern view. But if the different covenantal spheres of the family and church are co-opted by the state, and their God-given duties and responsibilities are not respected, tyranny and statism will be the result. Before the United States, civil government got involved in welfare programs.
Poor people in this country were far better taken care of. Orphans were far better taken care of than they are today. People don't know that. It was all done by private institutions. It was all done by churches. And it was way better than what we have now, where people are just paid to sit and smoke crack and smoke dope and drink beer and watch soap operas. They're not taught to be responsible. When the church was involved, it was way better. And people were taken care of. George Grant has written an excellent book on this, and I forgot what it's called, but it's excellent, where he documents how when the politicians learned how to take money and buy votes, they put the church out of business. Those who want the state to collect money for the church and write checks to pay teachers or pastors are naive and are not taking the fall or the record of history seriously. You know, if you're a, a so-called Christian college and you take funding from the federal government, there's strings attached to that. There's strings attached to their money. You lose your independence. As Bible-believing Christians, we must call for dismantling of the welfare state, including every aspect of taxpayer financing for education except perhaps for police or military academies, which is a legitimate part of the civil sphere. A state that collects money for the church and writes checks to the church will eventually have strings attached to that money. History proves that. If the civil officials want to give gifts to the General Assembly of the church out of their own pockets, or from the spoils of war, or from gold or oil deposits found on a military base, that would be different. For the state would not be forcibly taking away Paul's tithe to give to Peter and his children without Paul or the church's permission, oversight, or control. I'm not opposed to the state giving money to the church. Let's say we, we get attacked by some Muslims and we go over there and we conquer Saudi Arabia and we collect 100 billion extra dollars in oil due to that war. Of course, we wouldn't do that. Our country doesn't have any guts anymore. We don't know how to fight wars. But if they did that and the, the state said, well, we got all this extra money, let's give a billion dollars to the General Assembly and let them distribute the money for the poor and whatever they want. No strings attached. That'd be fine. But that's not what these people are arguing for. They're, they want the state to collect taxes and pay pastor salaries and pay uh, teacher salaries and that's dangerous and unbiblical. The Bible does not allow the imposition of some sort of top-down bureaucratic tyranny in the name of Christ. The kingdom of God requires a bottom-up society. The bottom-up Christian society rests ultimately on the doctrine of self-government under God with God's law as the publicly revealed standard of performance. It is the humanist view that promotes top-down power. And that's why I've been calling them Christian status. I'm not doing this to make fun of anybody. I'm not doing this to mock anybody. But sad to say, what they're advocating is in, in accord with secular humanism. State-financed education must be rejected because it explicitly contradicts the word of God and essentially destroys the family and the church's financial responsibility over education. In addition, it violates the biblical teaching that financial help, whether involving charity or education, is first a family or private concern, even before the church steps in to help. Paul in the New Testament, this is how he deals with charity. Find family members to take care of it. If you don't have family or extended family members to take care of the problem, then we'll get involved and the church will take care of it. We'll send some deacons over there. And in the apostolic church and in the ancient church, they had uh, widows, an order of widows or women deacons who were not anything connected to men deacons. The men deacons had control over them to an extent, but they weren't ordained and they weren't, they weren't deacons but they dealt with issues uh, related to women where it would be improper for a man to be there. 
For example, a woman has a baby or something, or a woman's hurt and she needs medical attention. And that, in the Middle Ages, developed into nurses and hospitals and all that. State wasn't involved. Family and close friends and the members of the local church are able to determine real need while a faceless bureaucrat in Washington or the state capital or even the county seat of civil government cannot determine who is truly in need and who is lazy and poor deliberately. Now, I've been around. I've, I've, back in the late 70s when I was a street preacher, I, had, I administered to poor people quite frequently. And I've dealt with a lot of quotation marks around it, poor people. And my assessment is, is that probably 90% of people who are poor are poor deliberately. In this country, the United States, where we're, we're a very rich country, if you want to get a job, if you try hard, you will eventually get a job. So it's very important that the church get involved and private citizens get involved, private Christians, and they determine real need. And that's why the poor laws in the, in the Bible are so great wisdom. Gleaning is hard work. They didn't just hand over money. Now, if you see somebody gleaning and they're doing a good job and they're hard workers and they're truly poor and you want to give them make their gleaning easier, give them some grain like Boaz did, that's great. But you don't just hand money over to people who like to sit around and gamble and drink beer and smoke crack, which is what our country does. When you do that, you subsidize wickedness, you subsidize evil, you subsidize laziness, you subsidize the poor, and you get more poor people. But the reason our government does it, our civil government does it today, is that's how they buy votes. And that's why over 90% of uh, blacks vote for Obama. Because he's a nursing father to their irresponsibility and wickedness. Now we're going to take a little break and then we're going to come back. We're going to have an excursus on the confession of faith and the civil magistrate's authority with respect to the church. A brief excursus and then we'll wrap things up. <clears throat> but I hope it's coming into focus. If we're going to have a philosophy of education, if we're going to have a view of how education should be financed, we need to develop it through a biblical exegesis of scripture and look at scripture in a specific way and develop our teaching from that. If we're just going to simply have some overarching general principle and import our own presupposition, presuppositions into it, then we're not going to be biblical. And let me tell you, when you have uh, proto-Roman Catholics like James Jordan, when they argue for Roman Catholic style of worship, they argue from so-called overarching general principles. And what does that allow them to do? Define things in their own way. The same thing with Christian statists. They ignore what the Bible teaches about the Levites, they ignore what the Bible teaches about charity and the poor. They ignore what the Bible teaches about the covenantal spheres of the family and the state and the church and how they have different responsibilities. And they simply advocate the state getting involved in things it has no business getting involved in. And that leads to statism and that destroys what the church ought to be doing. Christian schools run by elders and parents would be a wonderful thing. Good schools. And we need such things because there are people who are not able to teach. There are people who are too poor to deal with it or too busy. And we need to have that as a, a fallback when you have a church big enough to have something like that. It would be good. And especially it would be great if we had a Christian nation, which we will have eventually. It just takes, takes time. Church has to get its act together. Okay, we'll be back in a minute. We'll take a little break. Let us pray. Father, <clears throat> we thank you so much that you do tell us what to do in your word. And you tell us what to do specifically. And even in general matters, you teach us by way of implication. We ask, Lord, that you would illuminate our minds, that we would understand your word, and that we would apply it in our lives. We thank you for that. And we pray for reformation, <coughs> that the Reformed churches would stop their love affair with Roman Catholicism and holy days and all kinds of garbage and pagan concepts of evolution and creation and pagan concepts of all sorts of things and get back to the Reformation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.